How's everybody doing? Awake? <laughs> cool. Uh, so I'm Kavier, and I'm here today to talk with you about locks, specifically lock internals and some performance. Uh, now I take it everybody here is familiar with multi-threaded programming. Cool. So you're all familiar with locks. You all probably love locks. <laughs> no, right? We all use locks. Uh, but locks have somewhat of this big, bad, scary reputation. And this is for good reason, right? We've all probably worked with or heard about systems um, that where the locking caused performance problems. Here's an example from uh, one of our production services. This is from Samsara, where I work. And this is a graph uh, of a service that's a critical component of our read pipeline. So we care a lot about the latency of the service. And this graph we see, this is from pretty recently, where the latency went up by about 10x, and we trace this down to lock contention. So we know locks, eh, better be kind of cautious, better yet, try and not even use them, right? But that said, this production service is written in Go, and the Go runtime uses locks extensively under the hood as does your favorite operating system scheduler, your favorite memory allocator. So really, locks are everywhere. So what give? What is it about locks that causes them to have this, this fascinating spectrum of, of, of effects on the performance of our programs? And what, in what scenarios do they do well? When do they cause a problem? And what can we do about it? These are the questions we'll answer today, and to do that, we'll first uh, we'll first talk about lock internals. We'll then talk locking performance, and then finally, we'll touch upon smart locking strategies. Uh, now, first things first, before we begin, an important note: uh, everything about locks, the lock implementation and performance, is specific to the hardware, the instruction set, the operating system, and the specific language implementation. So today we'll be, assume a standard uh, SMP system. So we have multiple cores uh, that share a memory bus. Uh, we'll assume x86-64 um, running modern Linux, and we'll look at the lock implementation in Go. Now the reason we choose Go is because it's a modern programming language. It has a sophisticated concurrency model, um, and so it has sophisticated lock implementation. Uh, speaking of Go, any Go programmers in the house? OK, a few. Uh, you're wearing Go for t-shirts, too. <laughs> cool. Um, so for those of you who are not Go programmers, don't worry. I got gotcha. you. Um, all you need to know about Go for this talk today um, is that the unit of concurrency in Go is the Go routine. And Go routines are conceptually very similar to regular threads. Uh, so you'd use them just like you use threads in a language like Java or C++. But the big difference is that they are uh, user space. So they are run and managed entirely by the Go runtime and not by the operating system. So they're created and scheduled by the runtime. Uh, the details don't matter right now. Now, like with regular threads, um, when you have two Go routines accessing a shared memory location, that access needs to be synchronized. And you, you can synchronize it using uh, Go's lock implementation, the implementation we'll be looking at today, the sync.mutex. Now, the mutex is a blocking non-recursive lock. So uh, there are no try-acquire semantics. If a Go routine tries to acquire a lock and it can't get it, it will block. OK, now with that out of the way, let's turn our attention and talk about lock internals. Or better yet, let's just build a lock. OK, so where do we start? Well, let's see. Um, let's start with what we know we want and work backwards. Um, we know we want locks to give us mutual exclusion, right? That is, say we have this simple example program. We have two Go routines um, that access a shared task queue. So T1 is the reader. It's going to read tasks in the task queue. And T2 is the writer that puts items into the queue. Um, we know we want whatever lock construct we build 
To make it so that T1 and T2 can never access that task queue at the same time, right? Cool. So how do we do this? Well, let's see. Do we just use a flag? The way this would work is our flag is going to track whether the task queue is being accessed already. So whether it's free, if it's free, it's going to be zero. If it's being used, it's going to be one. Um, the code, the way the code would work is you have the reader. It checks to see if the flag is zero. So if the task queue is free, um, then it sets flag to indicate that the task queue is in use. It does its thing. It unsets flag. Now, if flag is one, however, it means the other go routine is accessing the task queue, so it's simply going to loop. It's going to try again. Pretty simple. Uh, the writer code looks exactly the same. Now, does this work? Are we done? Can we go home? No. <laughs> no. This doesn't work for a couple of reasons that both come down to what finally gets run on the hardware, right? The first problem is with this line, this flag plus plus. This is compiled down in x86 to the increment instruction, which is run by the processor in three steps. This is a read, modify, write instruction. So the variable is read from memory into a local CPU register. It's modified. Here it's incremented. And then it's written back to memory. So our single instruction has resulted in two memory accesses. Now, why is this a problem? Well, what this means is that it's totally possible for the read and write of a thread's read, modify, write instruction um, to be interleaved with the other thread's read. So it's totally possible for T2's read to start after T1's flag plus plus and still see the old value of flag, to still see flag equals zero which is no bueno. Now, these, um, these instructions, uh, these operations, uh, this is an example of a non-atomic operation, right? All this means is that other processors can see its effects half complete. Now, operations can be non-atomic because they use many CPU instructions, so they're compiled down to many instructions under the hood, so like a load or a store on a large data structure, um, or because they compile down to a single CPU instruction, but that results in many memory accesses, like the example we just saw. The opposite of a non-atomic operation is an atomic operation. Um, and in x86, loads and stores that are naturally aligned to within a cache line, these are guaranteed to be atomic, right? Um, and these guarantees come from the fact that x86 is cache coherent. So it guarantees that if your data fits within a single cache line, then all the CPU cores, they have a consistent view. Um, this is cache coherency. They have a consistent view for a single cache line. So atomic is good, and atomic is what we want. But using a flag is not atomic. And there's another problem. The second problem has to do with this block of code. And uh, so this is the setting the flag, reading task, setting the flag again. And the problem with this, do you all see the problem with this? The problem with this is a problem we're familiar with thanks to the recent Spectre and Meltdown, which is that memory operations get reordered. They can be reordered by the compiler. So over here, we see that the flag equal to 0 is reordered to happen before the task before reading tasks. And the processor can also reorder memory operations. So in this example, this is an example of a store load reordering, where the, the load, the read of tasks, is hoisted to happen before the write. And the reason to do this is to, is to hide write latency. Writing is expensive because of cache coherency, because of cache invalidation uh, that have to happen. And so this is something that x86 does. What it does is it starts uh, the read while the write is in progress. So that can happen uh, to hide the write's latency. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. So the compiler and the processor, they reorder memory operations all the time to speed things up. Um, there are some rules around what they can and can't reorder. And this is uh, the, the, the only cardinal rule is sequential consistency for single threaded programs, right? So they can reorder things as long as it doesn't change um, uh, it doesn't change the order as visible to a single threaded program. Now there are other rules in the case of the compiler. This is captured by the programs, by those, the language's memory model. So Go and C++ and, and I think Java too. Um, they guarantee that if your multi-threaded program is data race free, so you've used synchronization constructs in all the right ways, then it guarantees that memory operations will not be reordered, that your program um, remains sequentially consistent even, even as a multi-threaded program. Um, as, for as for, this is compilers reordering. As for processor reordering, the rules around that are captured by the hardware's memory model. So in the case of x86, for example, um, this is a form of relaxed consistency called total store ordering. And what this says is most reorderings of memory are not allowed, they're not valid, but store load reordering, like the thing we just saw, that's totally valid. All right, so our flag is not going to work. It's not going to work because it's not atomic and it doesn't give us memory ordering guarantees. OK, um, no problem. Uh, why don't we just build a construct that gets us atomicity and gets us memory ordering? Easy, right? Well, no. But luckily for us, the hardware provides. The instruction set exposes these special hardware instructions um, that give us atomicity and give us uh, memory ordering guarantees. And x86, an example uh, of a memory instruction that, is, that gives us atomicity is the exchange instruction. Um, and an example of um, instructions that preserve memory ordering, um, these, these instructions are called memory fences or memory barriers. And examples are the memory fence, the store fence, and the load fence. Now, the really powerful tool x86 gets us, though, is the lock instruction prefix. Now, the lock, is it, the lock prefix is an instruction prefix. You can apply it to certain memory operations, like loads and stores and increments. Um, and this gets us both. It gets us both atomicity and uh, memory operations are preserved. The order is preserved. Um, in fact, these lock instruction prefix are, are, are the things that power atomic operations in most programming languages. So this sounds useful. Can we use this to solve our conundrum? Why, yes, we can. The lock prefixed compare and exchange instruction, or the atomic compare and swap, is exactly what we need. Um, this, um, this instruction conditionally updates a variable. So only if it's equal to a, a certain value does it update it to another value. But this read, modify, write is atomic, which is, which is exactly what we want. So let's take this atomic compare and swap and try and build our lock with it. Back to our example program. Here, we're just going to, all our, all our operations using all our operations on the flag variable, we're going to make them atomic operations. So we're going to use the atomic compare and swap to check if flag is zero, and if it's zero, to set it to one. Um, and we're going to use atomic operations everywhere else. Now, if that atomic compare and swap fails, we're just going to loop around and try it again. Makes sense. Um, does this work? Actually, it does. It does work. This is 
a simplified implementation of a spin lock. And the spin locks are used extensively all through the Linux kernel. So um, what does this cost us, right? That's what we're interested in. Well, let's just measure it. Here, oh, before we go on to measuring it though, an important note is that these atomic compare and swaps, they are the quintessence of any lock implementation as we'll see throughout this talk. Um, cool, so measuring it. So here we have a simple micro benchmark. Uh, we are going to perform, so this is in C, we're going to perform an atomic store 10 million times in a tight loop and measure the time it takes uh, per operation. Uh, we see that with one thread, so when there's no contention, it takes about 10 nanoseconds. So this is 10 times, about 10 times as much as a regular operation. Now in the contended case, when we have 12 threads, it takes about 12 times as much, which is exactly what we'd expect, right? Because these atomic operations effectively serialize our threads. Um, so cool, we have this construct. It gives us mutual exclusion, it gives us atomicity, it prevents memory reordering, and it's pretty inexpensive. Should we ship it? No. There's one big problem. And the big problem is that we have this thread just spinning, just busy waiting, and uh, this is wasteful. It burns CPU cycles, and it takes precious CPU time away from other threads that could be running. You know what would be really nice? It would be really nice if um, when our thread did this compare and swap and it failed, if rather than spinning, we could just put it away. If we could just put it to sleep um, and resume it when it can, when the value of flag has changed and it can try again, right? That sounds nice. Well, lucky for, uh, lucky for us, the operating system gives us a way to do just that. In Linux, um, you have these few texts and futexes provide both an interface and a mechanism for, for user space, for programs, to ask the kernel, to request the kernel uh, to sleep and wake threads. The interface piece of this is the futex system call, and the mechanism is uh, kernel-managed wait queues. Um, let's see how these futexes work in practice. All right. So we're going to extend our flag variable to be able to take on another value. So zero if task queue is free, one if it's locked, and two if there is a thread waiting, if there's a thread waiting on the value of flag to change. Here in our reader, we do the atomic compare and swap. Assume it fails. Here first we're going to change flag to be two to indicate that the thread is going to sleep, and then we uh, issue the futex system call to tell the kernel to put us to sleep, to suspend us, uh, to tell the kernel we want to be woken up once the value of flag changes. The kernel takes care of that part, and then once we're resumed, we're going to try and compare and swap again. Now switching to kernel land, let's see what the kernel does. Now the kernel needs to do two things. The first thing is it needs to store away this information that we have T1 waiting on the flag and waiting on the flag variable so it can be resumed in the future, right? And the way the, the Linux kernel does this is we generate a key from the user space address. We need to do this because we're in the kernel now. Um, and this is in, stored away in a wait queue entry that stores the thread and the key. Now, if we had one wait queue per user space address, that sounds incredibly wasteful, right? So what actually happens is the key is, we use a hash table, the key is hashed, um, and we have a wait queue per hash bucket. But what this means is you can have two user space addresses um, that hash to the same hash bucket, and those entries would be stored in the same wait queue. Uh, not a problem, because the entries store the key as well. Okay, cool. So now that we've stored away this information uh, to resume the thread later, we can put the thread to sleep. So this is what the kernel does. It deschedules the calling thread. 
Now, on the writer side, say the writer comes along, it finishes what it's doing, um, it's going to set the flag to unlocked, and then it's going to issue a few text system call to tell the kernel to wake up a thread that was waiting on flag. Now, the kernel does its thing, it finds the right hash bucket, it walks the wait queue, and it wakes up the first thread that was waiting on flag. Um, all right, so this is pretty nice. Uh, this is really convenient, right? This implementation we saw was an extremely simplified Futex implementation. Futexes are notoriously tricky, but conceptually, this is how they work. And what they give us is this nice lightweight primitive to build synchroni synchronization constructs like locks. Um, in fact, the pthread mutex uh, that you use in C and Java, um, they, are, they all use variants of this futex. So our question again is, well, this is nice and all, but what is this upgrade going to cost us? So we measure it. Here's our micro benchmark. Uh, this is again in C, so we're measuring uh, the cost of a, of a lock unlock pair for a mutex, for a pthread mutex. And we see that in the uncontended case with one thread, again, it's about 10 nanoseconds, which is the cost of an atomic compare and swap, which is what we'd expect. It's that atomic compare and swap that succeeded. In the contended case, though, with 12 threads, the cost goes up to one microsecond. And this comes from the context switching cost, from switching um, into, from that syscall, from switching into the kernel, from the waiting. That's where, that's why it goes up to a whole microsecond. So at this point, it's worth asking if it makes sense uh, to sleep rather than spin, right? And, and really, it comes down to an amortized cost argument. Uh, it makes sense to spin if the lock duration, the, the time for which we're going to hold the lock, is going to be short. But the trade-off is while, holding, while spinning, we're not doing any useful work. We're burning CPU cycles. And so at some point, it makes sense to pay the cost of that thread context switch to put the thread to sleep and run other threads so we can do useful work. Now, this insight, this trade-off, is captured in hybrid futexes. Now, hybrid futexes, the way they work, the way they work is the thread um, does that compare and swap. If it fails, it first spins a fixed, a small fixed number of times, and if it still doesn't get flag, only then is the thread suspended. Now, these hybrid futexes um, are pretty clever. And uh, this is um, a variant of the pthread mutex uses the hybrid futex. And Go has an internal futex implementation. And this is a hybrid futex. Cool. So at this point, we've evolved from spin locks to futexes to hybrid futexes. Are we done now? Well, we could be. And if we were talking about a language like Java or C++ that has a native threading model, we would be. But what about a language um, that, uses a user, that uses user space threads, like Go with its Go routines? Can we do even better? Now, the whole thing about user space threads is that they run on top of regular threads. So the Go runtime takes care of multiplexing, of scheduling Go routines on top of regular operating system threads. But the Go routines themselves run entirely in user space. And so context switching between Go routines is cheap. It's fast. It takes tens of nanoseconds rather than the one microsecond we just saw. Now, why does this matter? Well, this gives us an opportunity to do something clever. This gives us an opportunity to block the goroutine 
rather than the underlying operating system thread. So if a Go routine tries to acquire a mutex and it can't, we can totally put the Go routine to sleep without, um, without putting the underlying thread to sleep. So we don't have to pay that expensive thread switching cost. Now this is clever, and this is exactly what the Go runtime does. The Go runtime um, has an implementation, has a semaphore implementation. Now the semaphore uh, is conceptually very similar to the Futex we just saw, except it's used to sleep and wake up Go routines, not threads. Uh, now let's see how this works. Um, in our program, when the compare and swap fails, the Go runtime is going to add the Go routine to a wait queue, except in this case, the wait queue is managed in user space. Um, the wait queue looks very similar to the Futex wait queue. We have a hash table and we have a wait queue per hash bucket. Um, the details of the, ha of the wait queues themselves are slightly different, but the details don't matter today. Um, and once the Go routine has been added to the wait queue, the Go runtime deschedules the Go routine by calling into the Go scheduler. Now the Go, the Go routine is suspended, but the underlying thread keeps running, and the underlying thread just picks up other Go routines to run instead. Now when the writer comes along, it finishes its thing, the Go runtime, um, the Go runtime walks the wait queue, finds the first Go routine uh, to run, that, that was waiting on the flag variable, and then it reschedules it onto an operating system thread so the Go routine can run. Um, cool. So this is clever. We've found a way to avoid that heavy thread context switch cost. Now at this point, we could almost be done, but we're not. And we're not for a couple of reasons. There are a couple of problems with this implementation, and they both come down to this. They come down to the fact that once a goroutine is woken up, so a goroutine tried to acquire a lock, it failed, it was put on a wait queue, once it's resumed, it has to compete. It has to do that compare and swap. It has to compete with other incoming goroutines that are also trying to do the compare and swap. So it's totally possible it's going to lose again, and it's going to be put to sleep again. In fact, not only is it possible, it's very likely this will happen, because the other goroutines, the, the incoming goroutines, they're already scheduled onto threads. They're already running on the CPU, versus the goroutine that we just woke up, there's a scheduling delay before it's put onto a thread and run. So it's likely that it will lose. And this is problematic for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, we're going to unnecessarily wake and sleep, wake and sleep the Go routine, so we're going to pay that Go routine context switching cost over and over again. Um, and secondly, this can cause Go routine starvation, right? And this in turn means that there's like a high scheduling tail latency which can show up in our application's performance. So what does the Go runtime do about it? Well, the Go runtime adds another layer of implementation, uh, another layer of sophistication around the semaphore, and this nicely wrapped up package is the sync.mutex that our applications use. And so finally, we can talk about the sync.mutex. Now, the, the sync.mutex, it's a hybrid lock, um, so, it, so if the compare and swap fails, the Go routine first spins a fixed number of times, and if that fails, it uses a semaphore to go to sleep and, and resume. Um, but it's not a simple hybrid lock. It's, it has that additional layer of implementation. It has this additional state tracking uh, that fixes the two problems that we just saw. Now, the details don't matter today. If you're curious, ask me afterwards. Um, but yes, this is our sync.mutex. We have arrived. And again, our question now is, what does this cost us, right? What does this 
What does this fancy mutex get us performance-wise? Well, let's see. In the uncontended case, it takes what we'd expect, about 10 nanoseconds, the cost of an atomic compare and swap. In the contended case, it seems to take about a microsecond again. That's curious. So let's dig into it more. Let's break down that contended case performance uh, and compare it to the p-thread mutex implementation and see what's going on. Well, we see that initially, as the number of goroutines increases, as the contention increases, there's a significant difference between the go performance and C's performance. Um, but eventually, once the concurrency level, the number of goroutines gets high enough, that difference gets smaller and the, the ghost performance starts to converge with C's performance. Why does that happen? We, we expect Go to do better than C because of this fancy mutex implementation, because of goroutines. But at a high enough concurrency level, that doesn't hold true anymore. Well, I let you in on a secret. Remember mutexes use semaphores? And semaphores had that hash table? What happens if you have two goroutines both waiting on variables that hash to the same hash bucket and need to be added to the same wait queue. It's almost like those hash buckets need to be synchronized. So we need per hash bucket locks. It turns out these per hash bucket locks are futexes. So what happens at, at like high enough concurrency is is we're seeing thread contention. We have threads contending on getting the hash bucket futex. And so we're paying the thread context switching cost. Now, wait a minute. The futexes also had a hash table. So do the futexes also need per hash table locks, per hash bucket locks? Yes, they do. And the futexes use spin locks. And so we've come full circle. We have mutexes, which use semaphores, which use futexes, which use spin locks. It's locks all the way down. Um, you know what this reminds me of? Have you all watched the movie, The Inception? It's like that, but with locks. It's totally wild. Okay, so at this point, we're, we're done. It's time to move on. I could stand here and talk about lock internals all day, but let's turn our attention to um, talking about performance. Now, we've seen that there's a huge disconnect between the lock and performance and the uncontended and the contended case. Uh, we knew that from our programs, but now we understand why. Um, what our micro benchmarks don't tell us, though, is how our application's performance degrades with concurrency, right? As contention increases, we know performance is gonna get worse, but how much worse is it gonna get? Because really, as application developers and systems builders, um, what we'd like to know is, as I increase the number of threads in my program, how is my program's performance going to change? We care about this for throughput considerations. If I have a target throughput, um, how, how many extra threads should I add while keeping response time the same? Or perhaps you care about latency. So, how, um, so uh, as I change the number of threads, how much more can I speed up my program? How can I decrease the latency of my program? And to answer these questions, we turn to the theory. And the theory says use Omdahl's law, maybe. Now, Omdahl's law, you're probably familiar with. Omdahl's law basically tells us that the speed up, how much speed up you can get um, by adding threads, by increasing the concurrency, that speed up depends on the workload. It depends on how much of the workload is serial versus parallel. 
So that's the formula for Amdahl's law. It doesn't mean much to me. Let's just measure it. Um, so in our simple experiment, we are going to create different workloads. The workloads are pretty much the same, except they have a different serial fraction, so a different fraction that's done holding the lock and a different parallel fraction. And we're going to scale up the number of guillotines and see how that affects our performance. Um, this is the Amdahl's law graph. It tells us that um, when, our, when, our, um, when our workload is mostly serial, we expect, uh, as the number of threads increases, we expect the program to get faster up to a point and then flatline. But that line is going to be a lot lower. We're going to start to flatline a lot earlier than if we had a, a highly parallelizable program, right? Which is what we'd expect. So Amdahl's law is one way of getting at this. Um, but, and Amdahl's law is good and all. But Amdahl's law doesn't account for an additional um, cost factor in the performance of our programs. So our programs don't just exhibit contention, they also exhibit coordination, a coordination or a crosstalk penalty. And Amdahl's law doesn't capture that, but a performance model does, that does capture that is the universal scalability law. And the universal scalability, scalability law, or the USL, it tells us that um, the scalability of our programs depends on both contention, on how much contention there is in the system, but also how much coordination there is in the system. And the graph the USL gives us is that it looks like this. Now, don't let the formula scare you. Breaking it down, all this tells us is in a system with no contention penalty and no coordination penalty, we expect linear scaling. We expect that straight line. As we increase the number of threads, we expect the throughput of our program to increase, right? If there is contention, though, we get the Amdahl's law graph. So um, the throughput increases up to a point, and then it flatlines. And if we have both contention and coordination, then we actually start to see retrograde scalability. The way to use the universal scalability law is you get performance measurements from your application. So you measure its throughput or its response time at different concurrency levels. And then you, you can use R. R has a USL package. Um, you can use other, other software to extend this, to graph it, to predict as I continue to increase the number of threads in my program, what's going to happen to its performance. Um, Cool. So this, for example, is the same experiment plotted under the universal scalability law using the R package. Cool. So with that, we now have a couple of tools, a couple of performance models we can use um, to answer the question of contention and application performance. Um, it's, now let's talk about or touch upon, rather, a few smart strategies we can use in the case we start to see contention. What can we do about it to reduce contention? Well, first things first, um, profile, right? We see that locks have this vast spectrum of performance characteristics. Locks might not even be the problem. So profile your application. Uh, you can use, if you're working with Go, you can use the Go Mutex contention profiler. Um, if you're running on Linux, there are several tools available to analyze this. Uh, the resources are in the slides. This perf lock, you can write an eBPF script. You can use dtrace or system tap, depending on what you like to do. But yes, first profile. Now, if contention is actually the problem, uh, a few strategies are, one, don't use a lock. Uh, this sounds snarky. <laughs> But there are a few, uh, but what this really means is try and remove the need from synchronization from the hot paths, right? Um, for example, try and do more local, more thread local work. So in our producer consumer example, um, tr try and like copy on write or 
try and buffer work, try and batch work. Uh, another way to do this is uh, you can use atomic operations instead. So uh, for example, the, the, go, the go runtime scheduler, it has these run queues, and the run queues are totally lock-free. So lock-free data structures, the lock-free programming is available to you. Um, yeah, so those are, those are some things you could do here. Uh, the second strategy is if you do have to use locks, use more granular locks. So you're holding the lock for a shorter time. Uh, for example, you can partition your data. If you're partitioning data, make sure there's no false sharing. Um, that is, the locks don't fall on the same cache line or you'll have cache line bouncing. And again, you can measure whether or not there is false sharing by using something like perf. Um, you can use per processor locks. Um, the Linux scheduler, the Go runtime scheduler do this. And then finally, you can do less serial work. Uh, this speaks to the same thing. You move work out of the critical section. So this is a graph that we began with. Um, in this case, we use the Go mutex profiler uh, to determine that the lock was in fact the problem, and we restructured it so we were holding the lock for less time. Uh, cool. So with that, it is time to say goodbye. Thank you all for coming out today. I hope you walk away learning a thing, a tool, a strategy about locks. Thank you. Hi. Uh, the clever te technique used by Go runtime yeah. to make it context switching very quick, why can't operating systems use similar techniques? Um, well, in the case of the operating system, like the, the real thing, the real insight about what Go does is that switching these user space threads is a lot cheaper than switching the operating system thread. In the case of the operating system scheduler, it has to switch between, between threads. And the reason switching user space threads is so cheap is because it's all in user space. So you're not calling into the kernel. Um, if you were in the kernel, you wouldn't have to do that, but you're not switching, uh, you're not flushing the page tables, uh, you're not switching what's in memory because you're not switching. Like Go routines run in the same, um, there's no like flushing of state, if that makes sense. Cool. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hey, so how does the lock-free algorithms really, I mean, uh, synchronize the data? Do they use CPU spin? I mean, what kind of, I mean, like smart thing going behind the scene? Um, so lock-free algorithms use atomic operations. Um, lock-free algorithms are very tricky to get right. So, um, and, and uh, lock-free data structures, you can build them out of these atomic primitives, but only for certain, certain types of operations, only for certain types of workloads, and they're also very tricky to get right, which is why we don't see them more in practice. Um, how does uh, um, situations like a p uh, apartment threading, like uh, what's used in JavaScript for taking what would normally be uh, places where you have to lock and putting it into a, a single thread in a queue, um, mm -hmm. how does that compare performance-wise with dealing with the whole locking issue rather mm -hmm. than pushing it under the rug like JavaScript does? Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole like taking multiple threads and converting it to a single threaded thing, um, it obviously works around these synchronization problems, but you m might lose out on parallelism, right? Because at that point, you can't have multiple threads each running on a CPU core and doing something. So, you're, so the trade-off there is you're giving up on some parallelism. Um, so at the end, you were talking about sharding the data and making sure you don't have uh, false sharing. Yeah. Um, can you explain the reason for that? Yeah. So. Um, because of cache coherency, right? Um, each time a cache line is dirty, you have to perform these cache invalidations, and that's expensive because you have all this like 
traffic on the memory bus. You have one CPU telling all the other CPUs that might have the cache line. Um, you, you have to tell them to invalidate it so you can perform that write. Um, so th the whole like cache coherency and cache invalidation thing is, uh, thank you, the whole cache coherency and cache invalidation thing is, uh, is expensive. Uh, and so you don't want two items to end up on the same cache line because then you'll have this problem of cache line bouncing, uh, which is why false sharing uh, should be avoided. And yeah, cool. Any more? You said that mm, Go uh, routine suspending does not imp imply uh, system thread su suspending. Yep. So what does system thread, thread in this case do? And if it should be su suspended, will it be? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And it comes down to the Go runtime scheduler and how that works. Um, so when the Go routine is suspended, so Go's scheduling model is called MN scheduling. So the same thread, the thread that, uh, the, that the Go routine is, the, the thread that the suspended Go routine was running on, that thread has a local run queue of other Go routines that are waiting to be run. So it just picks up a Go routine from that run queue and runs it. Or there's a global run queue as well. So it might go to the global run queue and pick up a Go routine. Basically, it runs another Go routine. Uh, there are instances in which the underlying operating system thread would be suspended. So for example, if you perform a blocking system call, um, the thread itself will suspend because the system call is blocking. Uh, in that case, the runtime suspends the thread. So it's like a scheduler on, uh, on the scheduler. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so, so to follow on with that question, um, so are there performance hits due to the Go scheduler competing with the kernel scheduler? So for example, um, so you've got multiple Go routines um, operating in one user space thread. So that thread gets backgrounded because of other things that want to happen in the operating system. So do you, do you get performance um, hits because of there's just one single operating system thread um, in, in the, the Go's model? Yeah, yeah, you totally do. Like at that point, uh, from the operating system's point of view, it's just the Go, the thread that the Go routines are running on are just another thread. So they have whatever priority other threads in the program, uh, other threads would have. And if that thread is backgrounded or suspended because of other processes running, that's totally a thing that happens. Um, Go runs a number of threads. So Go routines are scheduled onto a small set of operating system threads. It's usually uh, set to the number of CPU cores you have to get maximal parallelism. Any more questions? Going once, twice, thrice. Thank you so much. That was cool. a great talk. Thank you.